Okay, thank you for joining us today, everyone, for our webinar. Just a couple quick things before we get started. You can use the questions panel throughout the webinar to submit any questions you might have, and we'll try to get to those at the end. And you can download the handouts by looking at the handouts panel. And your certificates will be available this Friday by logging into your account, and you can download those there. Rose, if you're ready to get started, go right ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I am super excited to have this conversation with you about um, disparity seen in breastfeeding. So we're just going to go ahead and jump in because I have so much information and I'm super excited. Um, so this is the title. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Rose Horton. I am my full-time job and executive director of Women and Infant Services uh, at Meet Decatur Hospital in uh, near the Atlanta metro area of Georgia. And I'm also the CEO and founder of Not On My Watch Consulting Partners. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. So I'm passionate about all things related to the birthing community, passionate about equitable care, um, and you'll hear more about that. Just wanna share with you that I have nothing to disclose so no conflicts um, of any sort for our time together today. And here are our objectives. We're going to identify healthcare practices that contribute to breastfeeding disparity. We're going to understand the historical trauma um, of breastfeeding for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, so for the BIPOC community. And we're going to discuss solutions to eliminate uh, the disparities because that's ob our objective, right? As uh, clinicians, as healthcare providers, we want to make sure that our outcomes are equitable. Um, and to that end, we want to talk about the solutions. So, because this topic is potentially an emotionally charged topic, I think it's important for us to ground ourselves. Um, and one way that I really appreciate um, grounding with a, a team is with the conditions of a brave zone. If you've um, heard me speak before, you've heard this, and I think it's applicable and great every time. So for our time together, the next hour, I'm going to ask you to join me. Number one, uh, face your fears and name them, right? Choose curiosity over judgment. Cy Wakeman, who's written so many great books, um, reality-based leadership is one of them. She said you can do one of two things. You can judge or you can help, but you can't do both. So I want you to choose curiosity over judgment. I want you to consider the impact, not just the intent behind your words. So even if your intentions were sterling and just so noble, but if harm occurred, you caused harm. I'm asking everybody to lean into discomfort, lean in with me, I'm leaning in with you because we know that that's a space of growth. Um, admit when you're being fragile and take it the next step. Give other people permission to say, I think you're being a little fragile right now. Let's acknowledge our collective imperfections, right? We're humans, that means we're prone to make mistakes. Let's acknowledge that and let's forgive often. Now, assume best intent was not in the original conditions, but I love that so much. Imagine if in every interaction we went into that we assumed the best intent from the person we're engaging with. Transformational, right? I'm asking all of us to call people in. Instead of calling them out, we have enough of the cancel culture. Everybody needs to be part of the conversation so that we can have substantive change. Seek authenticity. Embody your truth. So are you with me? You have some great emojis. Use your emojis. Let me know you're with me. You're ready to be courageous and you're ready to have this conversation. Okay. So I have this really amazing video that talks about the, um, the progression in our country from breastfeeding to where we are now. Um, unfortunately, the sound is not going to be able to work. So I'm going to share this with you. It's really a fantastic, fantastic video. And I apologize for uh, not working out the sound details. I take full responsibility. Um, but I want you to look at that because it was great. It was really great for me um, to hear the history and to hear how 
incredibly prevalent breastfeeding has been throughout the generations and when these changes occurred. So uh, Kim and the team will share that with you. So take a look at that. All right, so uh, not having this grounding video, we're gonna just jump right in, okay? We're gonna start with one of the really big factors of um, where we are now as it relates to disparities in breastfeeding. I'm gonna start with, with slavery. What's the cost of slavery? So slavery, the dates vary anywhere from 1492 to 1865, give or take 50 to 100 years. And I'm, I'm totally serious about that. So we know at least 373 years. So there's generations and generations and generations of, of people who were born into an enslaved um, situation, right? So what's the impact of slavery? One of the big impacts of slavery is the, disrupt, the disruption of family unit and family relations. And I don't even know if you can um, genuinely have family unit in a situation like slavery. So what we know for sure is that at the whim of the slaveholder, um, a child can be ripped from her mother's arms um, a wife can be ripped from her husband's arm, the husband can be ripped away and can be sold, or they wouldn't see each other again sometimes, ever, ever, ever. Um, and we know from really good history that that was a mechanism of controlling that slave owners used to ensure that everyone knew that all of the enslaved people knew that they had no control over them. We can't talk about breastfeeding without talking about the whole concept of wet nursing. The second picture that you see in the center. Enslaved women were forced and required to breastfeed everyone's baby but their own. I was really privileged to breastfeed both of my girls. Um, and I know that breastfeeding is not just a way to provide nutrients, right? to sustain life. It's also a bonding moment. I remember the amazing eye contact I would make with, with my girls and the coos as they got older, or the stroking of, of my face as, as they got older. And I can imagine for some enslaved women that there was bonding moments as well, looking at these babies and looking in their eyes and looking at their smiles and looking at their adoration and likely hoping that this child will remember me and will love me and will treat me kindly and maybe having an experience that was counter to that. Maybe the child growing to hate because hate was uh, learned, right? And growing to be abusive to that wet nurse. Another impact of slavery is that enslaved people were treated not as humans, they were treated as, as objects or as pets. And that's the third picture that you see. This enslaved woman is, is on the floor so that um, the child could have a picture on top of her. So we can't talk about disparities without talking about the historical trauma um, that has occurred for generations and generations. Now, I came across this amazing poem that was written in 2017. It was written by Heslove, and she, like me, used her imagination to pen this poem about what some of the wet nurses could possibly have said. Before I read the poem, I really want to talk about the graphic that usually shows up with this poem. Again, the picture is of uh, the sweet child and the enslaved person. The enslaved woman was part of it as well, likely her nurse or her wet nurse. But I can't help but look at that picture. I can't help but look at the enslaved woman's eyes and see in my estimation that her soul was totally crushed. That picture is so incredibly powerful. But hear the words of what Heslov said, I wish I dried up. I wish every drop of my milk slipped past those pink lips and nourished the ground. 
where the bones lay of my babies, starved while I feed their murderer. I wish I dried up so the Mrs. Baby would dry up too and be brittle, so I could crumble them to dust, return them to the ground, where all children of my bosom lay equal. Really powerful words to consider. Let's continue a little bit longer. This illustration, um, this artist rendition, and this rendition lives in many places. This one says that um, courtesy of Southern Illinois University of Medicine, it lives in the Pearson Museum and it lives many other places. Let's talk about this a little bit because there's a lot to unpack in this. So in this um, rendering, it's uh, J. Marion Sims standing in front of the woman who is kneeling at the table. J. Marion Sims was born in 1813 and died in 1883. So he was born and worked um, in the 1800s well before uh, the germ theory was recognized. I vehemently, vehemently am opposed to what this picture shows because I don't think this was reality at all. A couple of things that I'm opposed to. Number one, that an enslaved woman would be at eye level with a white male physician. That wouldn't happen. I'm opposed to the pristine white of the, the tablecloth. In my imagination, this was a dirty, bloody, stinky room. In his writing, Dr. Sim says that um, as a slave owner, that he at any time had access to women that he can experiment on. He was working on fistula repairs. He said that when he did surgery on um, Lucy, there are three known enslaved women that he worked on, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. Anarka is the one that's pictured on the table. But he said that he always had access to them, so he was a slave owner. When he did surgery on Lucy, she was 18 years old, and he wrote in his book that her agony was extreme. Or did I mention that there was no anesthesia used, even though anesthesia was available because um, enslaved people were not seen as humans, right? I don't think that there would have been two enslaved women peeking behind the curtain with curiosity. There would be no curiosity. There would be dread. There would be fear. There would be anxiety. I think that these women were physically restrained because if you're doing surgery, in my perineum without anesthesia, even if you threaten my life, there's no way that I could be still. I couldn't, right? The pain would be so significant. So when you think about these renderings and, and the way we um, create an image of the past in order to make us feel better about some of the things that happened in the past, we can't gloss it over. In his writings, he did surgery on Anarka when she was 17, her first surgery. He did 30 procedures, 3-0, on Anarka before mastering fistula repair and then offering it to um, white women with anesthesia for her feet. I have to tell you, the very first time that I saw this picture, I, I wept. I wept looking at this toddler who I'm thinking, I don't know, 17 to 19 months, no more than two years of age. Toddlers need naps. <laughs> they need snacks. They need the ability to go run and play. They don't need to be picking cotton. I grew up in New York City and I lived in Huntsville, Alabama for eight years. So when we first moved to Alabama, my first foray into the South, I remember we were driving and we saw these huge cotton fields. I had never seen that in my life. And I remember having an emotional reaction thinking about, you know, my ancestors um, likely were this land. So I asked my husband to pull over. I said, I, I want to get a closer look at cotton. I wanted to take a picture and I wanted to also um, pick a piece of the cotton 
Uh, there were no gates, of course, and so um, no fences or anything. So he pulled over and I went and I took a picture and I reached out to grab one and I immediately pricked my finger. Yes, cotton is prickly. So there's an art and science to picking cotton. And here's a sweet baby who's picking cotton. Here it says that um, we have to acknowledge that the black baby has the right to be treated as a child, which is continues to be an opportunity for us. All right, have you heard of the false quads? I hadn't heard of them until I started doing some research here. So Annie Mae Fultz, who was um, uh, deaf mute, uh, she was biracial, she was black and um, American Indian. She was pregnant and this is her, her physician, Dr. Fred Klenner. He was a family practice physician and worked with poor um, people. So he didn't have a big, robust, big city practice at all. And he documented that he heard uh, three distinct heartbeats. So they were expecting, expecting triplets. Uh, there wasn't a hospital nearby, so they didn't have access to an incubator. And he, what he did when the babies were born is he put warm water in a um, one of those plastic water bottles from back in the day and wrapped it up with gauze and put the babies on there. So um, delivered three babies vaginally. I can't even imagine now if I were to go to my unit and say, hey, we have somebody pregnant with quads and they want to have vaginal birth. Ooh, that would be very interesting with the team. Spontaneous vaginal delivery of three babies and to his surprise, a fourth baby uh, was delivered. This was the first set of um, identical quads in the United States, born in 1946. So not like forever ago, right? Born in 1946. So. Dr. Kleiner named the girls. He named them based on the names of uh, women in his household. All their names were Mary. It was um, Mary Catherine, uh, Mary Ann, Mary Alice, and Mary Louise. He named the girls. So the providers of uh, evaporated milk, Borden, Carnation, and Pet at the time were clamoring to get an exclusive with the Fultz quads because they wanted to promote their product um, because formula was too expensive for black people. And they said, well, this, you know, this is our opportunity. So of the three vendors, PET was chosen. Um, and PET formed a contractual relationship with Dr. Klenner, not with, not with the family, not with the parents, but with Dr. Klenner. And um, the family was given a farm, and Dr. Klenner thought it would be great to build a nursery and enclose it um, in glass, and every day from two to four. And they had visiting time. So people from all across the nation and all across the world were visiting these twins, these quads. So a really stark example of exploitation. Again, this happened in 1946. A couple of things to note. Three out of the four um, of the false quads died from breast cancer. One at age 45, one at age 50, one at age 55. They were never wealthy. They dealt with poverty for a long time. But there were other people that made a lot of money. For four years, they were the exclusive face of marketing and advertising for pet milk for four years. And what the literature says is that in four years, pet milk sold more evaporated milk than they had in 65 years. So it was effective, effective marketing. It absolutely worked. And guess what? During the pandemic, when we had issues with formula availability. You guys remember this? Of course you do. If you work with the birthing community, of course you do. I was so surprised on social media to hear from so many people 
Well, you don't need formula, just evaporated milk and Cairo syrup. I'm like, oh my gosh, people still believe this to be true in 2020. That's the false quads. And I thought all of that is really important for us to do our grounding. Let's talk a little bit about bias. This article that was posted in 2017 is um, a, um, a meta-analysis of 40 other articles from 2003 to 2013. And the question that was being asked is, is the level of bias that healthcare providers have, nurses and physicians, the same as the general population? And the answer is yes. Yes, it is. Um, because we are who we are because of our lived experience, right? Who parented us? Where did we grow up? Where did we go to school? All of our beliefs, all of that is formed. We are shaped way before we layer on our profession. So the answer is yes. As long as you're a human being, you have the same level of implicit bias as across the board. So in this article, what you'll see um, as we start all the way to the left with race and ethnicity, that's the higher level of, of um, bias. And then as we go towards the right, it, it's less. So more with race and gender, gender identification, uh, sexual orientation, and less as you get to social circumstances. So what is implicit bias? Implicit bias is tricky because it's not our conscious awareness, right? It's really in the back of our mind, the prejudice notions that we have about race, gender, ethnicity, and all the other things, even though it's not top of mind, front of mind, whatever uh, verbiage you want to use, it influences our judgment and decision making. So that's why it's tricky. And that's why we need to be aware of what our biases are, because we need to recognize them when we show when they show up. In 2020, the Black maternal mortality crisis, this quote uh, was shared due to the systemic racism that's built into our country, in our institutions, in our policies, our processes, Black people receive a different level of care by physicians than any other race uh, from childhood to adulthood. And some of you may be saying, oh, wow, no, no, that's too strong. Um, surely that's not the case. That can't possibly be the case. So in August of 2020, I saw this headline. I remember clearly when it popped up on my phone. Um, and of course, with something that's so, um, you know, salacious, it's like, oh my gosh, I need to read this. So this was a retrospective chart review of 1.8 million charts in the state of Florida um, between 1992 and um, 2015. And there were three significant findings from this chart, from this um, review. The first is um, for white babies, regardless of the race of the provider, whether the provider is black or white, Middle Eastern, Asian, regardless of the race, that the outcomes for white babies are largely unimpacted by the race of the provider. They have great outcomes. The second finding is that for um, Black babies, if they're cared for by Black providers, that their outcomes were good. And the third and the most worrisome uh, finding is that for Black babies who were cared for by um, White providers, they were three times more likely to die. So 1.8 million charts, right? That's pretty significant. And that is, um, clearly something that, that has significance statistically. So what is racism? Here's a great definition that I found uh, in Wikipedia. Don't make fun of Wikipedia. I saw lots of definitions, but this one was really great. Um, prejudice and discrimination based on race. So unlike implicit bias, you know, we're not aware of it, but with racism, we're pretty clear that there's certain people we don't like because of their race. Another really great definition that they had is that a condition in society where a dominant racial group benefits from the oppression of others, whether that group wants it or not. 
So all of this information that I've given you has really set the bar for us to look at breastfeeding context today in 2023. And why do we have the disparities that we have? We know for a fact that um, society has really sexualized the breast, right? There are many people who believe that um, the breast is, is not for feeding babies, right? There's shame associated for some around breastfeeding to the point that people feel like they have to cover themselves or go to a room and to hide themselves um, just to feed their baby. And there's record of people being called out for refusing to cover themselves because they know they're not doing anything shameful, they're just feeding their baby. And um, people have been called out and yelled at and called all sorts of really unpleasant names. And then that's compounded with the fact that the black body, the black female body has been over sexualized because there's lots and lots of history of um, rape and repeated rape of black women and black girls. And there's a perception that Black women are sexually promiscuous by nature. So if you consider this historical trauma, right, of racism and family separation of the wet nurse, if you consider all of these things that has happened and that has had an epigenetic impact on Black and Brown women's bodies, and move it to today to where Black women may have a friend, a family member, a spouse, a partner, a boyfriend or girlfriend say to them, you know what, breastfeeding is nasty. We're not gonna do, you're not gonna do that. You know, your breast is only for sexual pleasure, only for intimacy. You can imagine how difficult it is for a black woman to be able to navigate all of that information. And don't get me started on social media. Social media can be our best friend and social media can be, ooh, it can be that as well. Here's a couple of um, anti-breastfeeding articles in social media. Parents, put, put that stranger's breast milk down and pick up a bottle of formula. Um, we know that there's many, many communities who do breast milk sharing and do it really well. There's some really great, um, Facebook pages of families sharing that resource. Um, here's another one. Don't want to breastfeed the case for formula feeding as an informed choice. Let's talk about informed choice for a minute because I do believe, I do believe if we as clinicians, if we as um, healthcare providers, if we need a place to land as it relates to feeding, this is a great place for us to land on choice. Rose is pro-choice. If somebody were to ask me, Rose, are you pro breastfeeding or are you pro formula feeding? Rose is pro-choice. Because I think the best thing that we can do for the birthing community is to offer choice without judgment. <laughs> right? Offer choice without judgment. That's the best thing that we can do. What happens is that with it, like with everything else, we get so completely polarized. It's like the, those who are in favor of breastfeeding can't possibly be in support of formula feeding. And that's foolishness. Many things can be true at the same time. I saw a tweet about three years ago, it was before the pandemic, um, of an influencer who has millions of followers saying, it's time for us to normalize formula feeding. Because she was talking about the shame that so many women feel who are not able to breastfeed. I'll tell you, as a former labor and delivery nurse, I remember running into the struggles with my patients. You know, patients who have like very flat nipples, patients who have inverted nipples, um, there, there are so many things. And then there's a woman who is adopting. There's so many reasons why somebody would and could opt out of breastfeeding. And the reason could be as simply as, I don't wanna, right? If we could land in the place of, 
as a clinician, I support your choice. Let me tell you the pros and cons of everything, and then you make an informed decision. That would be so, so much better. So definitely we know that uh, social media can and sometimes be a problem. Let's talk a little bit about weathering. In case you haven't heard the term, weathering is actually the um, biological impact on our bodies, black and brown bodies based on racism. As you think about um, weathering and the increasing of the allostatic load, it's just like it sounds. So think about um, buying a beautifully, a bright, beautifully um, colored patio furniture. You know, you have this beautiful patio uh, furniture pillow, brightly colored. You buy it in the spring and um, your patio is in full sun. So by the fall, when you're ready to put your patio furniture away, it's not as brightly colored as it, as it was. It's the same concept of weathering and that there's definitely deteriorations uh, to our bodies, right? That could be measured. It's, there's an inflammatory marker that's actually measured that um, shows that. But I wanna share a couple of really great quotes from this article with you because I think it's impactful as we continue to talk about disparities in breastfeeding. So there's really considerable evidence that shows that um, prenatal exposure to maternal stress. So the parent is stressed and the infant in utero is exposed to um, that stress that it really influences the neurocognitive development of the baby. So stress, maternal stress prenatally impacts the neurocognitive development of the baby. So they go on to talk about emerging um, data that they are finding out that with that initial stressful exposure in utero, so fetus in utero exposed to the stress of the parent, that uh, the fetus is susceptible to epigenetic programming. So that means that the uh, um, genes show up a different way, gene expression is different. This epigenetic programming lasts throughout the lifetime and it can be passed on from generation to generation. When I think about this, it is like mind boggling. It's mind boggling to me, it's not just a little stress. It impacts development. It impacts how the genes express themselves. You're going down to a DNA level. It's pretty significant, right? And it's definitely a contributor. So what does stress do to our bodies? In case you don't remember, here are a couple of things that stress does to our bodies. You can start with um, the skin. There's changes to the skin texture, right? Your skin gets um, thinner and it doesn't have the tone, there's less moisture. There's changes to your immune system. And I'm sure you all know this, you see that big uh, russet color uh, circle. Uh, your immunity lives in your gut. It's all in here, right? So stress and increase in cortisol um, impacts your immunity. So you're at a greater likelihood of um, getting an infection or getting infectious diseases. It impacts your hormones. Look at this ki the kidneys, right? The modulation of your hormones is impacted by stress. It impacts your bones. There's a decrease in calcium absorption, so your bones are not as strong, so your likelihood of if you fall, you can fracture or break a bone. It impacts the brain with fatigue, reduced concentration. It impacts your heart with elevated blood pressure, with vasoconstriction. It impacts, it's not shown here, but it impacts something close to the heart, the breast, right? We know that a high cortisol levels impacts the letdown reflexes in the breast and it impacts uh, the ability to make um, enough breast milk. It impacts your digestion. You know, when you're stressed, you can't eat anything. You may have diarrhea, you may have nausea. It impacts the muscles. It impacts everything, everything, right? It's not just a little stress. 
So how do we change this? Kimberly Seals Allers, she's a, a journalist, she's an author, she's a speaker. Um, she also created an amazing app called Earth. It's birth, but she said she removed the B to remove bias. So she created the Earth app and it's the first of its kind Yelp-like platform. So just like you use Yelp, you know, you go to a restaurant, your favorite restaurant or a new restaurant, and uh, you take pictures of your food and you upload your reviews so that people can see, oh, okay, this person's food looks really delicious, but oh, they said that the service wasn't that great. And there was a really long wait. Oh, okay, and parking was really terrible. And then you can make a decision, but that food looks really great. They said, it's great. Okay, I'll take it. I'll do it. Or the food was terrible, but the ambiance was really lovely. So Yelp is great to help us make decisions about where we want to dine. She's creating the same thing for the Black birthing community, created by Black women for the Black birthing community. When her app is all said and done and beta testing now, the goal is to, as Black birthing community folks have an interaction with the healthcare providers, they can say, oh, this doctor's office was fantastic. I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt validated. There was so much compassion and so much empathy. This hospital was over the top, fantastic. I felt safe or I went to the emergency room and I felt totally invisible. Nobody saw me, nobody listened, nobody paid attention whatever the feedback, that's what's gonna be available in her Earth app. But she said this quote that I really love, uh, systemic racism in medical institutions will take decades to fix. It took generations for us to get here, right? So we know we're not gonna fix it overnight, it's gonna take a while. But what can we do? Give black people greater access to community advocates. That's something that we can do. Community support is really great. I found this really beautiful picture on uh, Chocolate Milk Mommies. Um, it's really important for us to normalize that Black women do want to breastfeed. So in this beautiful picture of um, Black women in all hues with their babies and all hues breastfeeding, that's really, really important. I made the decision to breastfeed. Um, I really think primarily because I had seen my sister, my eldest sister, I'm the youngest of four. I had seen her uh, feeding her babies. So for me, it was a no brainer. Even though I went to um, childbirth classes and I did the whole thing, I think the, the, the decision was already made because it was normal and I knew all, all the great reasons to do it. So community support, peer support, Racially concordant care is super, super important as we help to shift the disparities. Because the truth of the matter is, in the hospital setting, this is what lactation providers look like. Most of the um, lactation consultants are uh, international um, breastfeeding. Um, lactation consultants are nurses. This data was from 2019, over a half are over 50 years old, and a third are over 60. They're clinically focused. Again, there's value to racial, racially concordant or racial concordant care. And um, it's important to realize that those who are providing the support to our patients, it's important for them to resemble the patients as much as possible, to be able to have a conversation with someone who you know has experienced the same thing, and to be able to have that conversation with you is incredibly value added. I threw this slide in here because there's still a belief um, by many people that Black women don't want to um, breastfeed. But if, as you look in other countries, that have high numbers of Black people, you'll see that breastfeeding is really high. It's lowest here in the United States. So let's um, really eradicate that stereotypical thinking. 
All right, I'm gonna transition now to tell you a little bit about our story, why this is so, so important to me. In 2017, um, I coined the hashtag not on my watch. I coined that hashtag because I was at my wit's end with the rising rates of maternal morbidity and mortality. Jeez, oh man, I just knew <laughs> that we would have gotten over this and that we would have improved our care and that women would not be dying unnecessarily. We know that 80% of the deaths are preventable. So I coined that hashtag in 2017 um, out of my frustration because I said, what can I do within my locus of control? This was really a call to action for nurses. Um, hashtag created by a nurse for all the nurses who work in the with uh, birthing people. I wanted every nurse to join arms with me and say, not on my watch. That means I'm not going to allow any untoward preventable event to happen to you while I'm taking care of you. So during our, I think this is 2017, I had uh, joined the hospital in Atlanta um, in 2016. So um, here we are in um, 2017 having this conversation. So what we started to do was really get all the information that we could around implicit bias, around racism, around the concept of weathering. We wanted to learn, we wanted to be informed because we wanted to be part of the solution. And as we're doing our journal club, we started a journal club, as we're doing our journal um, article review, we came across this article and um, it was such a powerful, powerful article, um, and there were so many powerful and great articles. Um, the director of lactation loved this article so much that she took it to her lactation team because uh, she wanted everyone to read it so we can recognize ourselves and be part of the solution. When I started in 2017, I will tell you that our lactation department looked like the slide that I just shared with you. Our patient population, about 67 to 69%, it varies from month to month, are Black. So the majority of our patients are Black. And in 2017, about 80% of our lactation consultants were white. So 20% of them were people of color, uh, Latinx and, and Black. So part of our journey towards equity that started in 2017 was to look at um, our data. We created a disparity dashboard. And in creating the disparity dashboard, we looked at many, many metrics um, that we measured. However, we landed on focusing on breastfeeding because we asked ourselves a question, what is one metric that is within our locus of control? And breastfeeding within the walls of the hospital was something that was in our locus of control. So here's the graph that I remember clearly when we shared this graph, right, showing our progression in breastfeeding. And when you look at this, you're like, well, this is good. Moving in the right direction. We closed our nursery in 2010, uh, committed to couplet care. Um, in 20, we were preparing for to be a birth-friendly designated organization, uh, a baby-friendly uh, designation, birth-friendly too, but a baby-friendly <laughs> designation. Um, I'm happy to say we were the first hospital in the state of Georgia to get the baby-friendly designation in 2014. So we're, we're trending up. And then we had our redesignation in 2019. So if you were to look at this, you'd be like, oh, cool, you're doing all the right things, nothing to see here. The difference of aggregate data versus stratified data. So this is the stratified data. So what you're seeing here is at the very top line, the yellow line are our white patients who accounted for about 15, 17% of our population. So for our white patients that had really, really great outcomes as it relates to breastfeeding within the hospital. The black line is our trend. The orange line are the black patients, followed by the gray line are Latinx patients, followed by the blue line are Asian patients. So we noticed that we had a problem, right? And we wanted to ask the question, why? Why is this? And what can we do? And when I tell you we did a lot, we did a lot. We did a lot. We started by sharing information with the providers. We shared, okay, um, and it was blinded information when we first started. 
and then we were um, able to change it because it was important for us to uh, change the culture. We were able to change it so that it's unblinded now so that we can have that data transparency that's really important to us. So we looked at it by providers. We looked at it um, in labor and delivery because skin to skin is really important and that's how you start and initiate um, breastfeeding, right? We wanted to make sure that we removed all the barriers associated with breastfeeding uh, starting in labor and delivery. And then we looked at, were we able to meet breastfeeding goals um, across the stay for our patients? We threw data at our team on a regular basis so that they were informed about how are we doing because we wanted to have an impact. And I'll tell you that when my, my colleague, uh, the director of lactation, sent me this information, she, she um, texted it to me. I was traveling. I have to tell you that I was like, um, I was like in tears when I saw it because we were able, we were able in about a year and a half to create breastfeeding equity within the walls of the hospital. How? Because we were focused. We took ownership because we knew that we were part of the problem. So we took ownership and said, okay, not on my watch. We started recognizing champions because we had some amazing clinicians who went all out. So we recognized and made a big deal out of that. And of course, as competitive as we were in healthcare, everybody wanted to be a champion. And we promoted diversity. As we had attrition in our lactation department, we would reach out to the communities to say, hey, we have an open position. We'd love for you to give us a recommendation. And I'm happy to say that now our uh, demographic mix of lactation consultants is 50-50. So we're looking more and more like the patient population that we serve. And I'm super, super proud of this because disparities does not have to be a reality for us in our settings or in our communities. If we, if we could be that wonderful proponent of choice, and informing our patients of all the good and all the bad. I remember as an l and nurse having numerous conversations with um, my patients, especially with the teenage moms. I really had a warm place in my heart uh, for teenage moms. And uh, I would ask them, well, have you made a decision about feeding? And they're like, well, I'm going to bottle feed. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. Uh, tell me uh, how you came to that decision. I want to make sure that you have all the information. I mean, and I would tell them, you know, what are the benefits of breastfeeding? I said, my job here is to support your choice. I really want to support your, your choice. For those who are saying, you know, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm kind of on the fence. I'm like, that's totally fair. You've had a lot on your brain for nine months. That's totally fair that you're on the fence. While you're in the hospital, though, because you have this liquid gold in your breast right now called colostrum, which is so, so fantastic and so nutritious for your baby while you're in the hospital. Might I interest you in breastfeeding for a while and at least sharing that liquid gold? And trust me, I'm influential. I would frame it in such a way that like, oh, I guess, I guess that's fine. And what I loved the most about this, because I would visit my patients the next day on Mother Baby, I loved it when the patient would say, you know, I like breastfeeding. This is working out great. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so, so very glad. You know, we have that opportunity to offer all of the information in a supportive, non-judgmental, compassionate, empathetic manner and allow our patients to choose for them. So for us in our community in Atlanta, we have a couple of amazing community-based organizations that we partner with. We partner with Rose, Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere. We partner with uh, Black Mamas Matter Alliance. You may have heard of them. Uh, they're headquartered in Atlanta, but they're a pretty big deal. And we partner with the Center for uh, Black Women's Wellness. This is not even all inclusive, but it was important for us to partner and to amplify the work that they're doing. We have a patient family advisory program at my organization. It's been around for quite some time. Um, but what we found out when we really wanted to have PFAs in our service line, 
was that most of the PFAs were volunteers. You know, it's, they've lived their great life and they no longer work, so they're volunteers. So they were older of retirement age, not older. I take that back. And they were white. Um, so it was really important for us that our PFAs, our patient family advisors, those people who are going to be inviting to councils, right, so they can be part of committees and help us making to make decisions, we wanted them to reflect our patients. So we reframed the PFA program uh, and we wanted um, applicants to be of childbearing age, which only seems fair, right? A former, preferably a former patient, but if not, as long as in their childbearing age. And we wanted that diversity to reflect the patient population we care for. And that has been a great success for us. And we also created a perinatal equity council. The goal of this council is to ensure that we're amplifying the voices of our community. It's a multidisciplinary council that meets monthly. It keeps growing and growing. Uh, we just uh, invited two new teammates from behavioral health. And they were like, I heard about the perinatal equity council and we want to join. I'm like, uh, yes. Nobody says no to that. The more people, the merrier, and especially folks with um, that subject matter expertise of mental health, we want them to be a part of it. As you're looking at ways to change a disparity, it's about involving all the key stakeholders, right? Involving people in your community, um, involving uh, PFAs, thinking globally about um, how do we how do we change outcomes so that it's equitable? At the end of the day, I implore you uh, with love and compassion to to listen to Black women, to be committed to not being arrogant. I'm using arrogance in the most loving ways. Being arrogant to uh, believe that you have all of the answers for the community without having a conversation with the community. There's something we say in my organization, don't talk about us without us, right? Nothing about us without us. We need the voices of those that we wanna have an impact for to really make a difference. So I'm gonna end with one more slide. What I wanna say is we have talked a lot about morbidity and mortality, about disparities to the point that um, there's a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation and a lot of angst for the birthing community, especially the marginalized birthing community, coming into their birthing experience. That's not helpful. I already talked to you about cortisol and um, epigenetics and about weathering. That's not helpful, right? Now that we've informed everyone, we still have the opportunity to change a narrative. And I think we need to change the narrative to joy. Y'all, when I saw this on the Twitter, I was like over the moon. I'm like, this is so great. Joy is a form of resistance. Anyone else a rebel? I'm like rebellious. I, I am about the resistance. Joy is a form of resistance. There is no greater act of defiance than to thrive in life and be happy anyway, despite every reason not to be. I want us to change a narrative around joy as we have in conversations with all birthing people, with all um, breastfeeding people, with all people making decisions about infant feeding. Let's lean into joy. Let's share stories about, let me tell you how much I loved breastfeeding my babies. Let me tell you how I loved looking into their eyes, how I loved it when they smiled at me. Let me tell you the privilege and the joy that I felt that I was able to do that. How do we share stories of joy so that the birthing experience is moving from trauma and stress? We know we have the historical trauma, but how do we change a narrative now to joy? That's where I want to spend my time because we repeat what we don't hear. I'm tired of this, y'all. I'm tired, I'm done. I want to repair. I want to be part of the solution. And I think all of y'all are with me. You're with me. Yes, I know you are with me. Um, here's my slide with references. I know that Kim is going to share that with you. But in case you want to take a quick picture, you can totally take a picture um, of the slides and it'll be shared in the handout. Um, I also want to share this. If you want to connect with me, I am 
always open. The Not On My Watch community is open to all. Um, we'd love to have you connect at any time. Um, and then last but not least, and I think Kim is gonna come on board and we're gonna talk about uh, this and also see if there's any questions. I think we have about six or seven minutes to answer questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, you, Kim, and uh, go with next steps. Thank you so much, Rose. That was excellent. So we do have about five minutes or so for questions. Um, so everyone, if you'd like to submit your questions, feel free to use the questions panel to do so. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I will be sharing the link for the YouTube video that unfortunately we weren't able to play towards the beginning of the webinar. So you will be receiving that. And um, just waiting to see if there's any questions coming through. Okay, we do have some coming. Do you partner with WIC? Do you have peer lactation support in your hospital? Uh, yes and yes. We do partner with WIC. Um, I'm super excited because um, right before the pandemic, we uh, asked WIC to have an office within our hospital just to make it seamless for our patients to have the resources and you know the um, the certificates and coupons that they need and get them um, signed up for WIC so that there was no delay in care. So that was a huge win. So if you're able to do that, I definitely recommend that. Um, and yes, one of the one of the folks that we hired was um, a peer counselor who um, went ahead and got her IBCLC. So. Yes, we love peer counselors and um, we value that lived experience. We think it's really important for our patients. Thank you. The next question is, does Emory utilize donor breast milk in their mother baby unit? Your presentation was awesome and truly inspiring to me, says Amy. Hey, Amy, thank you so much for your kind words. Yes, we are big proponents of um, donor breast milk. Um, we use it, of course, um, in the NICU, and we also use it, we made a decision to use donor milk for hypoglycemia instead of um, going with the glucose gel. We have an algorithm for both, but we start with uh, the donor milk uh, for hypoglycemia, um, so yes. And we have a, a depot. Um, one of my big hairy dreams is that we're going to have a, um, a milk lab, but right now we have a milk depot. So the milk depot is a place for our community to donate if they have like a ton of breast milk and they don't know how to get rid of it. We're like, give it to us. We partner with the Austin Milk Bank and um, we ship it to them. Great. Thank you. The next question is... Oh. Sorry, give me just a second. It popped off my screen. Okay, here it is. I am a black woman, IBCLC. It is hard to be the voice to bring these issues to the attention of the department. Do you provide consulting for hospital departments? Yes, yes, and I just wanna, what's her name, Kim? I just- Is there a name here? I just got off of that um, question, but I will provide her contact information to you. Okay. If, I may I just say, to if I may say, her name is Natisha, and forgive Natisha me if I'm her. mispronouncing that. No, that's fine. I just wanted to Thank address you, her. Wendy. <laughs> um, so, Natisha, I just want to say that I see you, right? And I'm going to hold space for the fact that it's it's hard, especially if you're an only, or if there's very few in number, it's really hard to amplify this conversation um, in a way that feels safe. So I just wanted to hold space for that. And yes, I am happy to do consulting uh, wherever I'm needed and wanted. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm gonna squeeze one more quick question. In. We do have several others coming in, but I will get those to you so you can answer them and then I'll provide the answers to everyone. Um, but this last one we're gonna get to is, with your great improvement in exclusive breastfeeding in people of color, the white population decreased. 
I would expect that with changes that would happen. I'm just wondering if you have any insight to that. Yeah, and I think that's a really great question. And um, and when we, so we believe in data transparency, right? So we share information during our monthly meetings. We share it in our nursing leadership meetings. We share it in our uh, multidisciplinary meetings where providers and, you know, LC anesthesia, everybody attends the multi disciplinary meetings. So we believe in sharing the data. And that was one of the questions that came up. Um, and I thought it was really, really interesting. It's like, because it was like really concerned that, oh, it went down for the for the white woman um, versus, oh, it's equitable. Um, so in the spirit of equity, it's all about how much resources you have, right? And your ability to share resources equitably. So we anticipated that to happen. Um, and we think that that's what's supposed to happen. And we're pretty comfortable with that outcome, right? So don't perceive it as a takeaway from anyone. Perceive it more as um, equitable access for everyone, which should be our objective. Thank you for answering that. Looks like we are a little past the top of the hour, but thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. And thank you, Rose, for presenting for us. Just a couple quick things before we end. Your certificates will be available this Friday by logging into your accounts and you can download those. Um, and you can visit medilaeducation.com to register for all of our upcoming webinars till the rest of the year. And you can also go to medilaeducation.com and under the professional resources tab, you can view the latest edition of our leading lactation insights, which is our monthly newsletter. And you can also now subscribe to that so you never miss the latest edition. And once we end the webinar today, a separate window will open with the evaluations. So if you can please fill those out, we'd appreciate your feedback and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today.